I do what I do because I've seen God's power transform my own life, and He will do it for you. The key to everything is found in God's Word. I'm Joyce Meyer, and I believe that God can heal you everywhere you hurt. The consequences of certain things brings death. And when I'm talking about death in this way, I'm not talking about no longer breathing and being in a grave. Actually, in the Amplified Bible, it says the type of death that's being talked about, and especially in Romans 6, where we're going to read a couple of verses, it says it's the consequences of sin, for example, brings death, but it says death that comprises all the miseries that one can imagine both here and hereafter. So, how many miserable Christians are walking the earth? <laughs> you know, it's one thing to be a miserable sinner, but it's another thing entirely to be a miserable believer. We're supposed to be the happy group. Amen? We're supposed to be the ones spreading joy. Our lives are supposed to be salty. We're supposed to make other people thirsty to have a life like ours. That's why I say we don't even really have to worry about preaching so much if we just get out there and live the life that Jesus died for us to have. People are going to, you're going to be like a magnet and people are going to be drawn to you and want to know what you have and how they can get it. But as long as we continue to be no different than everybody else, except we go to church on Sunday and have a bumper sticker on our car. <laughs> Come on. You know what I'm talking about. I don't want to be miserable. I spent enough years of my life being miserable. And I don't intend to be miserable anymore. And you know what I've discovered? If I want to be happy, then I have to decide to be happy because the devil's not going to help me be happy. He's going to do everything he can to make me unhappy, but nobody, listen to me, nobody can make you unhappy if you won't let them do it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I've told you that I had all kinds of problems, I mean, like from being abused for 15 years by my dad. And I mean, this wasn't just an occasional thing. This was all the time, all the time, all the time, all the time. And I'm not going to go through all the nasty details. You can get it in other teachings and books. But I, I was in bad shape by the time he got done with me. And I looked okay on the outside. I mean, I didn't look like there was anything wrong with me. But boy, I had a mess in my soul. And you know when you have a mess in your soul, you know where it starts showing up? In relationships. Amen? Amen? For one thing, I didn't like myself because I thought something was wrong with me because of what he had done to me. And if you don't like yourself, you're not going to be able to get along with anybody else. And so I was miserable, and therefore, I set about trying to make Dave miserable. <laughs> and miserable people don't even realize what they're doing, but the honest truth is, is that when you're miserable, you really don't want anybody else to be happy. You want other people to be miserable with you, and you may, maybe don't even do it on purpose, but you really just try to make them miserable. My father was a miserable human being, and he did his best to make everybody else that he was around miserable. And we all let him do it because we didn't know that we had a choice. Well, Dave was a born-again, spirit-filled Christian who'd been praying for a wife, and he told God, make it somebody that needs help. Now, <laughs> you want to be very careful how you pray. <laughs> Can you imagine somebody praying that? <laughs> but see, that, that, that's what a strong, a strong Christian says, you know, I can take it. Give me somebody that needs help. I want to be used by you, God. I don't, you know, I don't even think he knew what he was doing when he prayed that. I'm sure it was just like <laughs> a, a divine, maybe he was in a trance or something when he prayed that prayer, but, you know. Let me tell you, he got somebody that needed help. And, but Dave was strong enough in the Lord that 
he would not let me make him unhappy. And the happier he stayed, the madder it made me. <laughs> Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah. All right. <clears throat> but it was one of the best things he ever did for me. Because I saw, now listen to me, those of you that are married to somebody that spends all their time trying to make you unhappy, come on. Or maybe you're the one that spends all your time trying to make somebody else unhappy. I don't know, you're the one that's here, so I gotta preach to who I got to preach to. And, but what I began to see was stability something I had never seen before. I began to see somebody who wasn't controlled by outward circumstances. Dave loved me unconditionally, but I had to receive the love. He didn't turn it on and off based on my behavior. He just was who he was. And one of the things that we need to learn is to be who God wants us to be no matter what everybody else is doing. Did you hear me? Maybe somebody's been mean to you, they haven't treated you right, and so now your temptation is you're gonna build a wall and you're not gonna let them into your life and you're not gonna talk to them and you're gonna give them the cold shoulder. Well, that's not the way God wants you to respond because now you're letting them control you. And what you need to do is just say, God, I'm gonna be who I am and I'm gonna trust you to take care of them. So I'm telling you that you don't have to let other people make you unhappy. And that's something that you can do, but only if you have self-control. Because your emotions, anybody who lives by their feelings might as well just get a rubber stamp that says destroyed and stamp it across your life. <laughs> we cannot live by emotions and ever have victory. Victory demands that we operate in self-control. When I'm talking about self-control, I'm not just talking about eating and exercising. I'm talking a lot about controlling your thoughts and controlling your words and your attitudes and especially these emotions that want to go down every time a circumstance doesn't suit us. We need to toughen up a little bit and be able to deal with disappointment and stay happy when we don't get our way. Come on, I'll say that to this side of the room. Stay happy when we don't get our way. Come on, can you be happy when you don't get your way? Amen. We spend too much time trying to get God and the whole world to serve us. And Jesus said he came to serve, not to be served. I hope you love me when the day is over. <laughs> For the wages of sin is death. Sin makes you miserable. Every kind of misery. That's why really, instead of getting so mad at people that sin and do things that hurt us, we, we really need to realize that hurting people hurt people. And I'm telling you what, sin brings its own punishment. You don't have to worry about trying to punish somebody who's sinning. It has its own punishment and it's misery. Do you really think that a drug addict is happy? No, they're miserable. Do you really think that somebody who does nothing but mistreat other people all the time is a happy person? No, they're not, they're miserable. Sin, the wages of sin is death. Death that comprises all the miseries that we can ever have in this life and in the one to come. Romans 8, 6 says, for to set the mind on the flesh is death. Here again, it's not talking about being in a grave, it's talking about the more you think about yourself and the flesh and what you want and what you don't have and what you think you should have and what other people have that you don't think they should have and you don't understand why you don't have it. Come on. <laughs> I mean, you just spend, you spend a whole day thinking like that and just see how happy you are by bedtime. <laughs> not, not gonna be too happy. But you can purpose to say, God, I believe I'm in your hands and you have a plan for my life. And as long as I obey you and do what you want me to, when your time comes to bless me, no devil in hell and no person on earth can keep you from it. Come on. 
Real promotion comes from God, not from man. And I have found this, and I preach this a lot. I hope you don't get tired of hearing it, but it doesn't matter to me even if you do because we need to hear things over and over and over and over. The flesh is naturally selfish. It wants what it wants. And we do need to take care of ourselves and we need to be good to ourselves because if you don't take care of yourself, you're not gonna be able to even help anybody else. But I'm not talking about being selfish and self-centered, what we need to do is purposely, everybody say purposely. purposely. I, I stress that because I have to do it on purpose. And I mean, I'm, I've i been hard after this God thing for over 40 years, almost 45 years now. I mean, studying the Word, and preaching the Word, and really doing everything I know to do to try to live according to the word. And every single day of my life, I still have to use self-control. I still have to say no to myself. And I still have to resist being selfish. I was just sitting and thinking the other day about some ways I'm just still so stinking selfish. And I hate it. I don't want to be that way. Thank God he changes us from glory to glory. But what I have to do is purposely, everybody say purposely, Think about what I can do for somebody else. I just challenge you, like take for example, just exhorting somebody or edifying them, which basically means to make them feel good. Just to make somebody feel good. Imagine that, you have the ability, every single one of you has the ability, no matter how many problems you have, you have an amazing ability to make somebody else feel better. Think about that. And I would venture to say that far too many are not using that ability at all. They want everybody else to make them feel better, but they're not really giving their life to making other people feel better. I took on a little new project. I'm, I'm pretty goal-oriented, and so I like my little God projects, things that I feel that God wants me to do, and, and I make a... I make a thing out of it. And so, for a while I had this thing going on and now it's, it's become more of a habit. See, when you do something over a long period of time, it becomes a habit, and so then you don't really have to try to do it anymore. You just do it and don't even hardly realize you're doing it. You know, like, I don't have to try to go brush my teeth. I mean, I brush my teeth three, four, five times a day and don't even realize, you know, I'm not like, okay, now I have to go brush my teeth. It's just what I do. Well. For a long time, I was kind of practicing this thing. Be sure you put a smile on at least three faces every day. Do something to make at least three people smile. Well, now my new thing is at least one time every day, at least one, surely I can do one. Come on, how many of you think you can do one of something? Okay, one time a day, I want to reach out to somebody either by email or phone or in person and I want to compliment them and say enough to them to let them know they're appreciated and that they have worth and value. Now, so if anybody wants to join me in my quest, you can join me. How many would like to just set a goal that once, at least once a day, come on, say I can do it once, <laughs> at least once a day, you're gonna ask God, put somebody on my heart that I can bless, that I can appreciate, and instead of getting on social media and telling every bad thing you know about everybody, <laughs> come on, don't do that kind of stuff. Don't get caught up in that. Don't even read that junk that you see. You don't know that it's true. I'm telling you, whole reputations are being ruined by social media and people are just telling lies about people and talking about stuff. I mean, some of the stuff that's, that's online about me, I mean, I, I, almost, I never hardly ever look at it, but I kind of, it, it's amazing where they stick stuff. It's like you'll be in the middle of looking at an ad about dish soap and all of a sudden, here comes up the latest secret about Joyce Meyer <laughs> or whoever, you know. Joel Osteen, or this one, or that one, or somebody else. And so I was dumb enough to open that one up and take a look at it, and I just thought, I did, I did not say that. I did not do that. 
And I'm telling you, we have to stop believing everything that we read because just because it's in print doesn't make it true. And, and don't, don't be part of that. I mean, I'm grateful for all the technology God's given us, but let's use it to build somebody up. Let's use it to edify somebody. Get on there every day and tell something happy. Tell something good. Say something that's going to put a smile on somebody's face. Tell a clean joke. Thought I better throw in clean, just in case somebody doesn't know the difference. <laughs> Romans 8, 6, for to set the mind on the flesh, to just think about me, 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 is death. But to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. You know, if you think more about what you can do for other people than what somebody ought to be doing for you, you're going to have life and peace, and that's going to turn into joy. But the more you think about what you don't have, what you think you should have, and what somebody else has, you don't think they deserve, and the whole thing I went through before, the more miserable you're going to become. We control our happiness a lot more than we think that we do. Come on. I'll just tell you, I think you can be miserable. Any day you want to be miserable, you can be miserable. And any day you want to be happy, I think you can find something to be happy about. You say, well, I've got a lot of problems. Well, you know what most people do these days. And the more you think about them, the bigger they seem. And the more you talk about them, the bigger they seem. Whatever you focus on becomes the largest thing in your life. So the best thing to do is just get up out of your sad chair where you're feeling sorry for yourself and having your pity party and just go do something. Take a walk. Thank God for nature. Amen. Pet a dog. Do something. Get your mind off yourself and do something else. All right? A few quotes and comments on discipline. Lack of discipline leads to frustration and self-loathing. <laughs> You feel good about yourself when you discipline yourself. You know as well as I do, if you start out in the morning and you know you've got a plan, you know what you should be doing that day, you're going to get your house cleaned up, you're going to grow, you know, you're going to do this, you're going to balance your bank account, whatever it is, you've got a few goals and projects you want to get done. Well, if you do them at the end of the day, you're going to be able to sit down and relax and enjoy yourself and you'll just, you'll just feel good. But isn't it frustrating when you go through a whole day and you know you were just super busy all day long, and for the life of you, at the end of the day, you cannot figure out one thing that you did. <laughs> I mean, that is the most frustrating thing. And you know what causes a lot of that? Letting other people control what we do. We have a plan, and we let somebody else derail us. Don't think for one minute that the devil won't use anybody that he can use to get you off of your goals to frustrate you and keep you from being the person God wants you to be. How many of you ever try to study the Bible for one hour without getting interrupted? You know what? If the phone beeps, we just can't stand it. I mean, if the phone beeps, we've got to know who wants us. I don't know when we all got so important. <laughs> I mean, we, we get frantic if we leave the house and realize we don't have our phone. <laughs> my phone, where's my phone? Where's my phone? <laughs> Gotta have my phone. I mean, if you lose your phone in the house, it's like the world has to stop until you find the phone. I've been around a few years, so I remember when we used to have a four-way party line. Any, anybody that old? Okay. See? Now we're dating ourselves, but I mean, you, that meant four people used the same line. And so, if you wanted to make a phone call, and you picked it up and somebody was talking, you had to hang it up and wait again. And if you really wanted them to get off the phone, you'd pick it up and hang it down, pick it up and hang it up. And... <laughs> And then you'd really come into some money if you could have a two-way party line. And boy, then a private line, whoa! Now that was really big. 
And I remember when you were driving, if you wanted to make a phone call, you had to find a pay phone. <laughs> Come on. And it's amazing how well people did without us. <laughs> and now, and I mean, I do it too. If the thing beeps, it's like, I can't stand it. I gotta know who's trying to call me and what they might be saying. We need to stop letting all this other stuff control us. You know what? The world is not gonna end if you turn your phone off and spend an hour with God. Characteristics of a disciplined person. They always go the extra mile. They always do more than they... See, undisciplined people are lazy people or people that aren't excellent. They just do what they barely have to do to get by. But an excellent person or a disciplined person doesn't do that. Matthew 25, 1 through 10. Great parable, I'm sure you know it, but it teaches such a great lesson. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. <laughs> See, it's our choice whether to be wise or to be foolish. And a wise person does now what they'll be happy with later, even if it means sacrificing now for a future benefit. No discipline for the present seems joyous. Nevertheless, later on, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. I say some people live like there's no tomorrow, but tomorrow always comes. So live today in such a way that you'll be happy with tomorrow when it gets here, instead of then saying, oh, I wish I would have, when it's too late to go back and do what you should have done. When the foolish took their lamps, they took... The ESV Bible says no oil with them. The Amplified Bible says no extra oil with them. And I like that better because they took just enough oil to keep their lamps burning if everything went exactly right. <laughs> Come on, are you one of those people that it takes you 22 minutes to get to work? <laughs> if everything's just right, and so you do not leave your house until 22 minutes before it's time to get there. And then you go get in your car, you forgot your phone. <laughs> Gotta have the phone. Go back in and get the phone. Now you're down to 19 minutes to make a 22 minute trip. Then, oh my gosh, you forgot your sunglasses. Well, if you're like me, you gotta have sunglasses because my eyes are light sensitive, can't drive without the glasses. Then I gotta go back in. And then I get to the front door and realize I left my purse in the car and my keys are in my purse. Then I have to go back to the car. <laughs> Hello, is anybody home? Are we talking to you where you live? Now you got 15 minutes to make a 22 minute trip. <laughs> then you get behind a slow, older person. <laughs> that old man shouldn't even have a driver's license. You need to be on the road. <laughs> you are going to make me late for work. <laughs> Come on. Then you finally get to work. You're 10 minutes late and you lie about why you're late. <laughs> but you got a bumper sticker and you went to church on Sunday. Come on, give God a big praise.